From the Marquee Media Studio inside Mark Tank, it's the Mark Haney Show. Yes, this is the Mark Haney Show. We're on a mission to ignite the entrepreneurial revolution right here in the hometown we love. We are making it possible, or at least more possible, for entrepreneurs to jump in the game. And in today's show, we're going to have Sadie St. Lawrence, and she is a remarkable woman. She is working on an organization. In fact, she founded an organization called Women in Data. Um, And we're going to share a little bit of her insights Uh, around women in data because right now there are not enough women in data and so we're going to talk about why what she's doing about it and what we can all do uh, to bring women into this emerging uh, occupation and it is uh, it can be fun it's it it shouldn't be for just guys right and so uh, it's actually beginning to change but we're going to talk about how it is changing what else we need to do to uh, redouble our efforts to make it change even faster and at the end of the show uh, again I'm going to I'm going to touch on our our event coming up GFX um, that is a, a growth factories uh, event on August 25th. I'm going to share a little bit more information about that. If you have more, uh, interest in being a part of that, please let me know. But in the meantime, stick around, enjoy Sadie St. Lawrence. And now I'm here with Sadie St. Lawrence. She is the founder and CEO of Women in Data. Today, we're going to be talking about Women in data, which is, uh, you know, I guess that's your favorite subject, right? Is that, is that where you're, I mean, what is women in data and uh, how did it get started? It is my favorite subject and I will say I'm not a marketer because when I picked the name, I picked a very descriptive name, right? Nothing <laughs> fancy. You know exactly what it is right when you talk about it. Okay, it's women who work in data, right? Uh, 100%. Uh, so, I mean, so data though is pretty broad. What... Um, kind of describe kind of this realm of data. What is working in data? Yeah, so essentially we've identified about 50 titles today of what it encapsulates working in data and it's expanding over time. Originally actually our name was Women in Data Science and Analytics and what we realized when we first started out was the roles keep changing and there's adding new ones, right? Mm -hmm. There's AI, there's machine learning engineer, there's now machine learning ops, there's data journalists. And we're like, okay, what's the one thing that's consistent between it's all of these job titles? It's that you're working with data, Mm -hmm. right? So there's a lot of options in terms of what you can do. And whether you have a full-time data career as a data scientist, a machine learning engineer, even if you're not working in one of those roles, most of us interact with data today, right? When we read the news, COVID's a great example of all how we all had to become data professionals and mm-hmm. interpreting charts and monitoring numbers and looking at that. And so where we see things going is really that everyone is gonna need to be data literate. So to be able to read, write, and interpret data as we progress in the 21st century and continue to have relevant roles and jobs. Everybody's gonna need that? What describe uh, what what you mean by that? Just as a consumer, we need to, or or anything, we need to be able to understand data? So I'll give you one example. Um, Farmers, actually. People you probably wouldn't think like, oh, people who work in the field need to be data literate. Yes, they do because I don't know if you've been in a combine recently, but they're more like a robot device, right? Okay. So John Deere is an amazing data company, actually. And what they've done is now all the farming machinery is enabled with AI. And now, as a farmer, when you're driving one of these machines, you're looking at a dashboard that's interpreting your crop, the yield of it, where's the perfect place to plant it. And so even just by being a farmer, you have to look at charts and graphs to interpret the machine you're driving and to be able to get that optimal yield. Mm -hmm. So even areas that probably 20 years ago, right? If I would have said 20 years ago, a farmer is gonna need to be data literate. You would have said, I'm crazy. But in manufacturing, same thing, right? Amazon warehouses, robots run a majority of it, but now we see humans working with the robots, right? Even in those regards, if you're in manufacturing, you have to have some level of data literacy as well. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Okay, so women in data, um, it you're solving this, um, I guess, gender gap, if you will. There's less women in data. There's a lot <laughs> of women in data. There aren't enough women in data. Is that kind of the concept? Is like, let's encourage let's get more people more women 
into these kind of occupations? Yes, yeah, so our mission is to increase diversity in data careers. And where that came from was in 2014, I was transitioning into data science myself. And when I was in my master's program, I was in one of only five master's programs in the US that had started at that time. And there was only one other female in my program. And I was so surprised by this. I just picked this career and pathway because I was interested in it. So when I got there, I was like, where are all the women, right? Mm -hmm. Am I weird? Am I an anomaly? Or like, what is going on with are this? Are you right? into math? Is that why you chose data? Is that, I mean, because what would make someone like, why did you choose data? I mean, we'll start there too. What, what made you choose data? So I'm, I'm, I'm not into math, and okay. I have to say that um, in my ACT, I probably got one of the worst scores. I think I would have got a better, now that I do know more math, I would have got a better score randomly guessing than what I did at that time. <laughs> um, so I did actually music, which actually has a lot of math in it. And then I oh. switched from that to psychology and neuroscience. And I was working in a neuroscience lab found out I didn't want to euthanize rodents anymore, um, went home from the lab and wrote out what parts of my job I like, what I didn't. What I found out I really liked though was working with data, analyzing mm. it, the scientific method, et cetera. And so through a Google search of searching those key relevant terms, right? Even the AI was helping me then, mm -hmm. led me to the term data science. Got it, okay, so you're in the class and only one other female in the class and how many guys are in there? There are 30 in that cohort, and then, you know, all my teachers were male as well, okay. right? So I had one female teacher throughout my program as well. And when that, so that's it, uh, you're getting your master's at Villanova, if I'm not yep. mistaken. Okay, so you're in a master, high, very high level program, and two out of 30 uh, are women. Um, does, how does that translate to, so that's at the college level, mm -hmm. how does that translate to the workforce? Is it similar? Is there those similar type statistics? Well, thankfully it's changed a little bit, okay. right? So the, the equation isn't quite the same. So in data careers in general, we're looking at about 27% are, are female. And then if you p break that out into um, different subcategories like data science and AI, you're looking at about like 12 to 15%. Um, so, you know, it ranges a bit in that space. Uh, and I mean, it is changing though. That's the positive side of things. And it has changed since 2014 when I first entered the field. Okay, so with that said, why is it changing and what pro what's the problem? What's at the root of the problem? Yeah, so that's a great question. <laughs> I guess that's two questions, huh? yeah. <laughs> Well, let's first talk about the root of the okay. problem, right? So how we've broken it down into women in data is there's three three buckets of the problem. One is awareness, the second is access to education, and the third is advancement opportunities. So on the awareness side, I love the quote that says, you can't be what you can't see, right? Oh yeah. And I think that's a perfect description of the awareness of it. I found this through a Google search, right? Mm -hmm. But if I didn't happen to stumble on it, I don't know if I would be in the field. So we need to provide that awareness that this is a career opportunity for women, and it's something that they can do in the place that they belong. So that's part of it. And can I uh, maybe ask a question? So you, you said it's awareness, and then it's, what was the, the second and third one? Um, the access to education. Access to education, and then advancement mm -hmm. within, within, okay. What, what about the early, early uh, child, you know, the youngster that um, isn't really deciding what, you're like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah, I've never even heard a, a guy say data, right? <laughs> so, uh, but I'm like, is there things that are happening in like gram at the grammar school level that uh, are key to the problem as well? Yeah, so, you know, we have a program in Women in Data called Data Curiosity. It's to expose young minds to working mm. with data and interpreting it. So exposure definitely helps. Um, but I also like warn parents a little bit that you don't have to give your kids coding experience at an early age. It is helpful, but just for perspective, when I was a child, even through high school, the term data science didn't even exist yet, right? So I think it's just important to remember that 
the job the true jobs of the future are not fully there mm. right but what we can do and i think where it helps with younger children is opening their minds to critical thinking to math the basic skills that we know are not going to change and then for girls in particular making sure that what we see around when they enter middle school where they shy away from math and science that that isn't changing okay. right so i think if we can continue to push that from an early age um, that will help a lot in the in the long run that they're interested into some of these other stem fields okay as well. well sorry for derailing you okay so let's talk about the awareness piece so yeah yeah you didn't right you didn't have an awareness of it uh in 2014 um what what's happening in terms of awareness now what are we what are we doing right what are we doing wrong so what we're doing right is that the awareness of this just as a job is out there and and my descriptor of this is how the federal and state and local governments have started to adopt it like to me once government adopts this as like this is a job description we we know okay thank this god is we here. have government <laughs> i've never heard that before it's here to stay right it's not just some new trendy fad they're okay. like nope this is so a real thing if the government says uh, <laughs> this is uh, actually going to happen um people are going to start believing it okay yeah so uh, i mean the, data science has been around for over 10 years now but um just just this year, a lot of federal government institutions implemented it as an official job description. You okay. can actually even be a data scientist in the Army. So mm. there's a fun pathway if you want to go down that pathway. But more so the awareness of the jobs are reaching more people um, i think where we still need to make progress is in terms of the representation right so again can't be what you can't see okay i see the job but maybe i'm not seeing people who look like me in those careers today okay. and i think that's where women in data really wants to play a role is to highlight leaders and individuals and people working in the field to say hey you can be this person, and here's someone who you may relate to. Um, now, yours is women in data, but you you said your mission was around diversity. Is is the primary focus uh, the diversity uh, among between men and women, or are you focused on you know the other kinds of diversity that might be uh, underrepresented as well? Yeah. So you know we have different values and principles, especially for our local chapters, and the first value is that all are welcome right so men are actually welcome in women in data we don't see a high representation i think our names our name skews it off a i saw little. on your website you have one employee that's a that's a uh, a teammate that's a, a guy yes he was a brain women. so yes we love allies <laughs> in women in data so you know however you identify you are welcome in women in data and then we wanted to broaden it just from our mission from just saying that we're supporting gender diversity in this space to diversity as a whole, right? Because mm -hmm. even within um, women, right, black women are only represented 3% in the industry. And Latinas, it's around 6%. So we want to make sure that we're not looking at it just from a gender side, but looking at it overall as Where, well. Which uh, ethnic category is probably most represented within women? Is it is it white? Is it Caucasian? Or is it Asian? Or... I don't know, Middle Eastern? Yeah, so within the field, we see about a, an equal representation between Caucasian um, and Asian people. Okay. And then from there, it, it breaks down. So those two categories take up the majority of okay. it. Okay. And then there's about a 10% sliver left for everybody else. <laughs> ah, gotcha. Okay, so on the awareness piece, well, so what, what are you doing on the awareness piece? What does Women in Data do? I know you're, you do a speaking, you do speaking and you know, you're very, very well known um, in the industry, but like maybe give us a kind of an example of what that looks like. Yeah. So for me personally, even before I went full time with women in data, um, I got asked to teach on the Coursera platform with UCD Davis to teach a data science class. And it was not a good time in my life to teach. I was running women in data, working another full-time job, but I had never experienced a female data science teacher before. And I, just felt like it was important for me to have that representation. And I'm very happy I did because the class now has, there have been 400,000 people who have taken the class. Wow. So the representation has had an impact, um, which is very exciting. And then it, it was such a great example of what happens when you allow one person to have that representation because it ended up becoming a 
a series and the rest of the teachers were, were also female in that series that as must well. be like an online course that you take through Coursera so anybody around the country or around the world could take that class but it's through UC Davis yep okay yeah so it, thankfully it is online I don't know how I would quite do <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it in person and that is the power of building online products the the power of scale there so it's for me personally but from women in data side you know we we work as one global network but then we also where communities are aggregated and people want to step up and lead we have chapters so we have chapters in over 50 cities across the world where they're highlighting people in their community who are leading the way who are practitioners in the field who are interested in this subject and then we also do a lot from a global perspective with global webinars and podcasting mm -hmm. all the great things yes okay so on the awareness piece um I've got an idea of that. Now, the next piece is around education. Mm -hmm. talk, let's talk about that. Yeah, so once you get some awareness, they're like, hey, I think this may be a career path for me, or I think this is something that what we see common now is I can transition into, right? But then you probably go through one of the similar things I did was like, okay, I have some of the skills, but I'm missing, you know, I have some gaps in the other skills. So where we, because we are focus mainly on women and a lot of them have already graduated college or are already in a career we need to have access points to education that can be part-time mm -hmm. right so they can continue to have families and work and life etc but also to make sure it's curated in a way that leads them to a path to their end goal so today we have amazing products like Coursera and edX and you know a lot of continuing education programs but what we're seeing is it's like entering a library before there was the Dewey Decimal System right and before you had librarians to help point you to the right book so what Women in Data looks to do is to curate pathways for people where we provide that education but in a learning pathway where there's a target in career goal at the end okay interesting so what so walk me through what that looks like so I'm a woman working for uh, you know, I got a regular job, but boy, I, I would love to transition, make a mm -hmm. transition into more something around data. Do they come to you and what happens? Yeah, so we have a variety of learning pathways. Let's say you want to be a data analyst. Um, you can sign up to be, go on the data analyst track. It's, it's a one year track that you do part time. It's every two months and then you get a month off and you work into small cohorts of 10 people. So we're big fans of social learning and mm -hmm. learning from your peers. And so you take the classes online at your own time, but then meet weekly with your cohort um, to review the materials, ask questions, etc. By the time you're done with that, there's four modules in it. Um, by the time you're done with it, you've taken 12 classes. And so you have the, the foundational skills. However, what we're seeing in the job market today is education alone isn't enough to get you into that that first job or that job pivot. What you really have to do is show that you have the skills and in a technical field and in a data career, you do this through building out a portfolio. So once you're done with that learning pathway, you go on to a portfolio builder class where you build out projects to show the work that you've done and to be able to talk about it as you go into different employment opportunities. And that is something you guys do in house or you do that in conjunction with certain partnerships? We do that in house, so we have a variety wow. of, you know, classes we've developed um, and teachers that we have in house, and then we also do partner with Data Camp as well. Okay, um, and so they come out. Do they get a certification? Is that kind of is part of that portfolio uh, that they build? Is a, a, something they can take to an employer? Is that kind of the idea? Yep. So you get a certification. Um, we're also working on tokenizing the certifications as well. So not only will you have the paper certification, but you'll have an NFT that represents oh, it as well. Oh, that's cool. Um, so, Cutting edge. Yeah. <laughs> so making sure that they're ready for Web3 when we all transition mm -hmm. over to that. Um, but then, you know, really what's most important is that portfolio that they build themselves. So the education is great, but showing their own work and being able to talk about the problems that they solved, that is where they stand out to employers. Like what would be an example of like a, a project or a, something that would be in somebody's portfolio? 
Yeah, so for me personally, I really love fashion and style. So in my portfolio and even in my, the classes I teach, I always do things around the fashion industry. Mm -hmm. So f for I personally, just even last night, I was researching the company Shine because they have one of the best AI models and they are killing the game in retail. So for me, what I would probably do as a project would be to look at all of the retail providers, right? Scrape data off the web in terms of Maybe I want to look at the, maybe my question and problem is like, who's been performing the best over the last, you know, five years? And can I build a predictive model for the next five years of who's going to be performing the best and where? And performing I think the best when you're talking about like which retailer or which uh, manufacturer? Which retailer, okay. right? And so, and also, can I predict who will be for the next five years, right? And are there factors from that particular? prediction then that I can use to determine why one's performing better or why mm -hmm. one isn't. And then as an entrepreneur, I would use that model and say, okay, here are the indicators of what makes a company successful. I want to mm -hmm. take those indicators and now I'm going to replicate those some way in my business, mm -hmm. right? Okay. That's really cool. So they come away with this portfolio and they take that to, uh, to get the job that they want. Um, and so, so you're helping solve that problem, um, obviously. How many people are, go through your classes? Do have, you, have, you track that? Yeah, so last year we had 2,000 people go through this. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay, great. Wow, life's changing. Um, and then so on the job front, um, or excuse me, you mentioned the third piece of this is... Um, advancement. Advancement. <laughs> and why are people, why are women advancing and... Is it because there's just not enough of them there or is there discrimination? How does, what, what's, the, what's the problem? So we've actually started to make some good progress and I shouldn't say just women in data, you know, uh, there's a lot of wonderful women's organizations out there and this is the beauty of data. We can start to identify that root cause. And we see a really pivotal point at age 35 and what I call the five years of doom leading up to that. So if you combine the factors of when you should move into, when you typically move into a management position from an individual contributor position in your career, it's usually around the age 30 to 35. At the same time, when we combine the data of when women are having children, mm -hmm. it's around that same time as well. So you have two things that are lining up in a timing wise in your time series model, mm -hmm. right? And what we're seeing as a big problem is that women are not getting opportunities to move into a leadership position. Um, it usually takes them a few years longer than it does for their male counterparts. Yeah. When that happens and then you take some time off to have a kid, going back in, you're starting back even you know, even further, right? And so for a lot, it's, they're saying, hey, do I, is this something that I even want to stay into? So that's a problem. At the same time, there is discrimination. So if you're, if you've taken some time off, or even if you haven't, or you're struggling to move into that leadership position, you know, it gets tiring, right? And so you start looking out and say, is, are the grasses going to be greener on the other side? Maybe, maybe if I wasn't working on a team where I'm, you know, one of two or three females and was working on a more representative team, I'd have more opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. So that just overall, after having about 10 years in a career in this, you're pretty exhausted, right? So there needs to be a lot of work done to support individuals, especially at that pivotal point and helping to move into that first leadership well, position. Well, yeah, women are going to continue to have babies. We're probably not going to be able to attack <laughs> that problem. Uh, so the, what can be done. I mean, I, I, I suppose it's an awareness uh, even within that, within the, uh, you know, the, the executive suite might not even be tracking that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, but what are you doing and what, what can we do, you know? Yeah. So a lot comes to what, re what we reward in business environments, right? So a lot of times we're rewarding things of, um, you know, what we call confidence, right? Or being, you know, assertive. Unfortunately for women, it what being assertive is called for men is is being bossy for women, right? So why are you like that? <laughs> <I know. laughs> 
<laughs> I know, right? And why is the world like that? Why, why can't we have it a positive of both sides of the uh, thing? I, it's not the first time I've heard this. It's not just data that this is, exists, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think we can learn a lot from other industries because yeah. it's not just in you know a STEM field or a technical field. A lot of un- other industries suffer from this. So I think it's changing our perspectives in business cultures of what that looks like. The other portion of it is also making sure that they have the right mentors and support. So if if your leadership team isn't very diverse right now, you know, there's a caution sometimes too from you know, finding a mentor from another gender, right? And how that's going to look mm. in someone. And so making sure that those pe- people in those positions have the right support. I would agree with that because as a guy, older guy, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm, we don't want to put ourselves in a position that um, something might be uh taken the wrong way or whatever. So hell, oh my gosh, I got to have a woman with me if I'm going to be in a job, you know, you got to have diversity on my team. If I'm going to go in a closed door meeting with uh, a female, you know, that's kind of, it's it can be a challenge in terms of um, just concerns for even for the guys, even, um, so I'm making, I don't mean to make excuses, but I think that sometimes we're, and we're also maybe shyer around that scenario too, and probably vice versa. Yeah, I think it's calling it out that like, that is a real concern. Like yeah. there's a lot of men and women who would probably be great pairs together mm-hmm. in a mentor mentee relationship. And they may not have any ill intentions, most don't. But unfortunately, there's a lot of concern of what the public consensus and perception of that's mm-hmm. going to be. And I've actually experienced that in my own environment. I mean, I had fabulous mentors early on in my career. But that didn't stop the company culture from saying, you know, nasty rumors of saying other oh, things God. that may be yeah. happening, right? I'm mentoring and- a female now. Uh, hopefully nobody's saying, I'm meant, you know, because we're in the growth factory, we're yeah. in startups, and I happen to be mentoring a female, which is unlike me. Uh, you know, I've never really been a mentor before, but I, you know, I raised my hand and I ended up getting this great young entrepreneur, uh, but she's a female. and. Um, yeah, I made sure my family was in her, you know, they, they know her really well and all that. So it's like, okay. And, you know, so it's, there's no concerns, but uh, yeah, but if it wasn't this particular person, I would be walking on eggshells a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, I mean, even you took precautions, right? So I think one is just understanding, like we have to do a lot to reduce that stigma. Yeah. Right. And then There's an interesting neuroscience fact because you're talking about, you know, how do we support women moving into these positions faster? So women's brains actually mature faster than men's brains. No (laughs) way. Yes. Right? So I look at that and say, okay, so if this is true, right, and it's a very important part. Some of us never even mature all the way. It takes a long time. And and so, and it's the frontal cortex, right? So reasoning, decision-making, logic that matures much faster. So if we take that and and actually take the science, could we use that to actually propel women faster into these positions, right? So that they're in a higher position faster where they can use all of that cognitive ability. And and then maybe they have a maybe they have a longer likelihood of staying and coming back. Um, okay, so you lost me on that. That's how immature my brain is. Um, <laughs> so you're saying use data to change this? Yes. Can you walk me through that just a little slower? Because I want I, I, you lost me on that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So let's say we have two employees. They're both 25 years old. They've just started off in the company. One is male and one is female, right? Aud- right now, we know that the female, based on neuroscience, probably most likely has a more developed frontal cortex and higher cognitive ability, right, right at that age. How do we feed that female so that she can grow and move into that leadership position? What I'm going to quote unquote say faster, right? In Mm -hmm. reality, we know that men usually get promoted faster, right? right? But use that advantage of the cognitive ability early on to fast track women into those positions. And you said feed her. That would be, what would that look like? Yeah, so what we see is a lot of times women aren't getting those growth opportunity projects, right? Mm -hmm. So in order to have, you know, your peers in the leadership team say this person's ready to lead, oftentimes they need to see 
that you have led a project, right? And you have that ability. So it's giving someone that opportunity to showcase those skills. Interesting. So this may this is going to sound a little sexist. So I apologize to you or our viewers. So, but um, I, I'm, I'm I'm stereotyping, or you know, you know, just having being old and having known a lot of worked with a lot of men and women, have hundreds of employees and stuff. Women, by and large, maybe it's because of the more mature brain, they tend to get more stuff done. Right? They accomplish a lot. Um, by and large, not saying guys don't, but, uh, and so I'm wondering, and this, I'm, I'm, I'm forming this into, <laughs> into a question, is it because they accomplish a lot of tasks since they just get a lot of stuff done that they aren't handed the, uh, maybe the broader uh, leader uh, piece that maybe doesn't have to get as much work done? So I don't have hard scientific evidence on this, but I do have a few theories for why this is happening. And you're right, I mean, even within women in data, we see people who are more educated, right, are able to accomplish more, get more tasks done, right? But I think we need to look at what the root cause of that and where it stems from. Where it stems from, if you're in an environment where there's not equal representation of you, you feel like you have to work harder to show that you belong, right? Mm. And so, and especially in a technical environment, there's this feeling that, you know, of imposter syndrome or somebody's gonna find out. So I need to work harder to really show that I know my stuff and have these skills, okay. right? The problem with that though then is unfortunately a lot of people get promoted from a network-based model, right? Which is how well you know people mm -hmm. in the leadership level, how well you've promoted your own personal brand. But if you're over here trying to just prove yourself on a technical side, it's really hard to have that freedom to go out there and to network and to promote your personal brand because you're still in the mindset of like, I don't belong in this environment. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, okay. So what, and what are you guys doing to change that? How are you, you know, attacking that problem? Yeah. So we have an executive, um, executive data leadership form. So we want to make sure for the women who are in C-suite positions that they have the support they need because there are very few of them, but we want to make sure that we don't lose any of them and they feel supported and stay. And so we peer them into groups and they meet on a quarterly basis to discuss different thought leadership topics, um, whatever the group decides there. And then we're getting ready to launch an emerging leaders program as well to make sure that we're doing the coaching and support there. And then on an ad hoc basis, we have two support methods. Um, first is life coaching. And so this again is to really support on that confidence level, taking those risks, right? Helping helping women just in and of themselves feel that confidence to, to step up and lead to that next level. And then we also have a mentorship program. So this is where if you don't have a mentor, as we talked about, there's mm -hmm. a there's a big problem. Um, we help find one for you and, and, and solicit a program that will lead you through a six month mentorship program. Okay. Um, and thinking about, um, okay, so if we're at 12 to 24% now uh, of women that have these, these data jobs, um, What's the goal? Is it 50%? Is that really, is that a realistic goal? Or is that, how do you approach a, you know, uh, kind of a question, like you wanna have a goal that's possible. Yeah, well, I, I really love looking at gender statistics because it's it's the same across wherever you live, right? So whatever country you're in, yeah, there's all- Yeah, are like 50 plus, <laughs> over 50%, aren't you? It, it just tap over just a little bit, but it's usually 50-50, okay. you know, no matter what country you're in. So obviously that would be equal representation. However, a big threshold is actually at a 30% mark. So you want to be, and this is for leaders or, or people who are creating teams, you want to have a 30% at minimum representation because it has been found through science that at 30% representation, people have a feeling of belonging, which allows them to speak up for others, be able to advocate for themselves, and really be their true self in the environment. I've heard that um, 
you know, because if you look at the Silicon Valley and the way a lot of these tech companies have been built, let's call it, you know, Facebook or some of the others, that it's been built mainly by, mainly by guys. And so the algorithms and the way the things uh, work are almost from, because it was built by predominantly males, that it's um, it's skewing the, the way those businesses even um analyze customer data and so on. Can you talk about that? Am I, am I off base in that? No, you're not. So especially we see this a lot with computer vision. So if you're talking about AI models, mm -hmm. right, where essentially it didn't recognize people of color, one, mm -hmm. and it also misidentified women a lot as well. And that was just because not only is it not represented from the people building it, but then in the data set, right, what they're using to train the model wasn't represented either. They recognize nerds though, right? Yeah, the guys, oh, yeah. very well. <laughs> Sorry to yeah. all you computer people out there, but you know, it's kind of the, <laughs> the image that we have is the guy, computer nerdy guy, you know, basically building these really cool toys. Uh, and then, and then when you go to test out your really cool toy, who do you test it on? You test it on yourself probably, yeah. right? And then you test it on your buddy. You yeah. know, you test it on who's in your network, right? And that's really a problem we see overall. And when companies are being formed, you know, you ha are at such a high level of risk when you hire someone new. So normally you hire someone within your network because you have a lot of trust with that mm -hmm. person, right? But unfortunately, our networks aren't very diverse, right? We tend to gravitate towards people who are like ourselves. And so then it just perpetuates the problem further and further. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thinking about this, what are the uh, emerging, well, I'll have two more questions around this and maybe we'll talk startups a little bit too. So, okay, so the jobs of the future, we touched on that a little bit that we, they haven't been identified yet, but you're cutting edge, you're in the trenches. Like, what do you think the biggest uh, opportunity, you know, the jobs are gonna be really great for in data um, that maybe I can't imagine yet because I'm not a data person. Yeah, so where most predictions go out for the future jobs are about five years. And I, okay. the report I love is the World Economic Forum's jobs report. I read it back in 2015 and they predicted out five years and they were very accurate with that. And now I've read the new one in 2020. And so it's looking at until 2025, what are the jobs of the future? In the top 10 jobs of the future, Three of them are data related careers. So data scientists and analysts, machine learning engineers and AI specialists, and then big data engineers, so like cloud architecture and stuff. So I, you know, it sounds terrible when I say the number one job of the future is in a data career, because I'm not biased here, but unfortunately the data actually also <laughs> does say that. I feel very fortunate and lucky that I landed on in this career very early on, because I don't think even in 2014 I was able to predict that. So definitely data jobs are the And future. these are high paying jobs. What's, what's a, where does somebody start when you get a, uh, one of these jobs? Is it, I mean, are these six figures to start and how high, what's average? Yeah, so if you're starting out as an analyst, it's around, you know, 70 okay. to 100,000, right? Once you get into data science. And this is, is this working for like a big company or is this could be any company? This could be pretty much any company. Okay. And then once you get into data science, you're looking at over 100,000, 100, 150. Then you get into machine learning engineer, ML ops. Um, then you're looking at, the over 150. Now that's excluding fang companies, right? The, those prices you can, you know, kind of 10x it, right? Because mm -hmm. um, because they're always looking for top talent in this space. But just generally speaking, across the board, um, yeah, you have a and there's there's a big shortage of this kind of talent right right now. So is the shortage expected to if, if those are going to be the top jobs of the future? What are we going to see in terms of? Um, that pay should escalate, right? Supply and demand. If uh, if if those jobs are in such demand, that's why we pay them so much. Uh, are part of the reason. Yeah. What so do you I expect? think the, I think the pay is going to continue to increase. Um, it's estimated that 85 million jobs in the next five years are going to be automated. However, there's going to be 97 million jobs available 
because of the work in automation, mm-hmm. right? So if you're scared, my recommendation to people, if you're scared of automation taking your jo- job, sometimes you just got to join the other team. Right? Mm-hmm. Yes, <laughs> and, yes. start, and the great part about that is there's more opportunity on that side of yeah. things. And the pay is usually higher too. And it's probably going to be more interesting than uh, whatever, uh, putting groceries in the bag. If there's, if there's a machine doing it for you and you're running the machine, um, it seems like it would be more interesting than you know doing it yourself. Um, okay, so that was one of my questions. I know the other one uh, uh, lost. Uh, I lost. What else do we want to, in terms of women in data, what else did I not cover? Because I want to make sure I, I round that out for you so that you can, in case there's something I missed because I jumped around a little bit. Yeah, I think the, the big thing is really just how much value we've seen by just creating a community, right? So we talked a little bit about network models and how a lot of hiring that is done today is based on your network and how women in tech roles particularly and then in data roles do not have that equal representation and by being a part of women in data you get to connect with other people but more importantly it's just been incredible to see the knowledge sharing the support that happens and i think the really the power of women in data is is not in the programs or anything we do it's in the community it's in the people that connect with one another who volunteer in programs who go and start chapters um that really is the heart and the power and the soul and that to me is where we're going to be able to change things with the individual people connecting and supporting one another what about the cultures within a say a larger organization uh, is there are there are there sort of communities built like in, you mentioned the fang stock so let's just talk google i mean are there communities getting built within google to approach this or uh, yeah approach this kind of problem yeah so you know, a lot of organizations are supporting DNI efforts and have a focus on making sure that their hiring is more diverse. And a lot of organizations also have groups that um, they're like resource groups for different subgroups within the organizations. And all of those are great. Like I would say, continue to do those. However, the problem is if if you have a complaint with your organization, you're part of one of these subgroups of this organization, you may still feel a little bit limited within your power. So it's always, you know, whoever we are, it's always great to s- expand our network of people, right? Mm-hmm. I don't, there's never been a time in my life that I was like, oh, this was a real negative from expanding my network and meeting new people, right? There, the only positive things can come from that. So we really need to change the culture of the organization, really, to make so that people feel empowered to go change it. Yes, unfortunately, that's where it always starts, right? <laughs> yeah. Which is much easier said than done. You know, even a lot of organizations are working to become more data-driven, and they buy the fanciest tools and technology and try and hire, you know, the best people. But unfortunately, if you don't change the, the culture of the organization as a whole, even becoming data-driven as an organization is not going to happen. Okay, and so the other question just came to mind. Um, so you mentioned web... 3.0, um, you've thrown out terms like machine learning, but I mean, which, which in, uh, I guess, which sectors of the uh, job market are most, um, are most people, what's trending right now is like really fun and hot and like, uh, what's attracting people? Yeah, so definitely there's a lot of people moving into cryptocurrencies mm-hmm. and blockchain. Um, I mean, you're seeing it just from if you look at, you know, the previous founders in Silicon Valley, right? A lot of them have even left being founders and now are building building rocket ships or, you know, Mm -hmm. um, creating blockchain companies. Um, So that's definitely still a trend. However, I would say for the average person, it still comes down to machine learning Mm -hmm. and data science. Like data science really is kind of the gateway for a lot of people. I mean, even yesterday I watched a YouTube video from, it's called Silicon Valley Girl, highly recommend her YouTube. It's Uh, a, oh, it's a, it's a, is it a movie or what is it? It's a YouTube channel. Okay. And so she does a lot on trends and just um, shared a new video on the top you know, top 10 jobs of the future. Silicon Valley girl, okay. Yeah, and so even in her top 10 jobs review, again, I'm not trying to be biased, but her number one was still machine learning and data science. Interesting, 
Okay. Um, so with that, let's let's pivot the conversation a little bit over to my favorite subject, which is uh, entrepreneurship. And really, I'm focused today predominantly on startups. And I saw you at a Growth Factory event the other day, and I, I heard a rumor that you might be uh, raising your hand to help us a little <laughs> bit uh, with our, for those of you that uh, are, are maybe just tuning in for the first time to the show is like, we have something called the Growth Factory, which is a startup accelerator and an accompanying venture fund and what we're calling the Backyard Advantage. And the Backyard Advantage really is some of the smartest, most connected people in the region that get it, right? That want to help the most promising startups as well. And they want to join our community and help get that done. Um, and I heard a rumor that you might be somebody that was thinking about doing that or are doing that. Yes, definitely. I'm excited to be a mentor in this cohort. And I love giving back to startups because, you know, women in data is still, we very much talk in our company culture like we're still a startup, right? Mm -hmm. We're a very small team of people. And I didn't, I kind of fell into it. It all grew organically. And then it started being like, I actually think this would be something I would do full time. And then it became full time and then had to figure that out and figure out, oh, now I need more of a team of people. And I had to figure out how do you go from being a one, two person team to hiring more people and scaling a business. and. I'm still learning every day, but the things that I have learned in the past six, seven years, I love sharing whatever I can with people. And I think more importantly, I always learn so much um, from mentoring. I I love the quote that says, to, to teach is to learn. Mm -hmm. And I think it really comes when people ask you questions that cause you to think about things in, in a new way. So I don't look at mentorship as like one person who is who is better than the other, but really as a symbiotic relationship, right? Because I think everyone has a story to tell and something to teach and something to learn. And so if we all come in with that mindset, um, there's a lot of power that can happen through that. I agree. Um, and you're also, so thank you for um, coming in as a mentor. And uh, you, you're on, uh, you're on, you mentioned one advisory board uh, that you're on uh, with one of what happens to be one of our portfolio <laughs> companies. Um, is that something you do is uh, help startups from an, an advisory capacity as well beyond uh, the, the open grants that we talked about? Yeah. So, you know, I ran women in data in parallel with working as a data scientist and then as an AI strategy consultant. And as much as I hammered that this is the number one job for everyone, what we also see is most new companies have some facet of AI within their business, right? They're usually creating a digital company. And so if you have a digital company, you're collecting data and you have digital information and then you go, what can I do with this? Or how can I use AI and machine learning to make my product better? And so for me, like I, I don't want to let all that experience go to waste. So I really enjoy working with startups, especially from that technical aspect, but then also just from what I've learned from um, growing women in data as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we only have a few minutes left. I just wanna make sure that, uh, I, I like to ask questions about just kind of getting general advice. So our audience might be a parent of a college student. Mm -hmm. It might be an entrepreneur, a startup. It could be a venture capitalist, but maybe we'll take the uh, the entrepreneurial side of, of it or the, per, uh, the parent that's got a college student because the college student's probably not listening. <laughs> uh, maybe, uh, but like maybe just advice for maybe how to approach, um, their ambition to uh, get going in data um, and how to how to move toward that job and then maybe uh, anything to a startup founder that uh, that they might want to hear as well. Okay, so I'll break it up into two categories. One for the parent who's encouraging the kid and then mm -hmm. the, the startup. So for the parent, I mean, you're just at a disadvantage if you have a kid in college because they aren't going to listen to you. Too late. I'm just gonna, <laughs> They're I'm lost. Just gonna let you let go. go. Just right? let go. You're not. You're not cool. You're not relevant. <laughs> and they probably won't listen yeah, yeah. to you, right? That's awesome. <laughs> So I don't have a lot of advice uh, there, hilarious. but if you want to try, you know, I would say find things that they're interested in, which 
let's say it's TikTok, right? And everybody talks about the TikTok algorithm, right? Well, maybe you find a really cool article that actually breaks down how it's created. I actually got to interview somebody who worked on the data science team from TikTok and had amazing things to share on the data they collect. All right, and what if you're a parent of your kid? He's still, or she, or she is still listening. Maybe <laughs> that's uh, 11, right? You're the parent of an 11 year old. Yeah. Let's take it there. What would you? What advice would you give uh, to the parent of an 11? year old um, knowing that they probably are demonstrating the kind of aptitude that might be really perfect for data well I would tell them to find women to data's data curiosity program and have mm. them join that nice. the other thing I would say is help them to see and recognize that data is all around them and that they're actually creators of data right so just helping point out like when you use your phone right you're creating data because we all need to be we all actually need a lot more education on the digital trail we're continually creating and leaving so i think just opening up that awareness you know in the data curiosity for 12 year olds one of the things they do is have them start categorizing things and so they categorize like toys and legos and different different things that are in their environment and showing like how you can take you know, regular objects in life and convert them to data or how you use a phone and, and the data is automatically being created for mm -hmm. you. So okay. I think the awareness side is big on that age. Okay, that's really helpful. I'll, I have a granddaughter that's that age. <laughs> um, and then uh, let's, let's speak to the entrepreneur. Yes. Some words of wisdom, encouragement. Yeah. <laughs> you can do it. Yeah, so this one's really hard because I, I see a lot of entrepreneurs who know this is something that they need to add into their product. But then if they hire a technical team or even in the early days, you maybe outsource and contract some people, a lot of these projects fail because there is no translator between the technical team and the business side of things. And so I think it's important to understand that even if, if you don't aren't big enough to have you know that translator, somebody who understands your business and who also understands how AI works, then you have to do some of your own education, right? So there are, just to be able to, you don't have to have enough education to be able to build the product, but it's to be able to translate to your technical teams the business problem you're trying to solve so that they can translate in that into an actual AI model that will be useful for you. Okay, so get a translator. <laughs> what, where do you, what is that translator, that translator's, uh, Really, it's very technical, but they're they understand business. Yeah. So one of the things that we see, unfortunately, a lot on the technical side is people have spent a lot of time learning how to build an NLP model or computer vision model, and so they all they know how to code it, but they don't actually think beyond that in terms of like how is this going to be implemented into the product into the app etc and that's actually just as important if not more important additionally that's the implementation side i should have started before which is on the building side a lot of times you're using data from the business from the product whether that be from your website your app you know if your biomarkers and sensors that you have so really understanding how that product works is going to be helpful when you're looking at the data that is produced from that product, right? Mm -hmm. That will save your technical team hours and hours. And if you're paying for that, you want to be saving that time, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Sadie, I, uh, I think you're changing the world, so thank you. But thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for helping us with the Growth Factory. Thank you in advance. Um, and, uh, you know, Sacramento's lucky to have you. I'm lucky to be here, so happy to be on the show and be a mentor and excited for what the future holds. Thank you. Welcome back to the Mark Haney Show. Great show. Sadie is a wealth of knowledge and she is going to be sharing her uh, insights with the founders at, uh, at the Growth Factory. And, you know, it's people like Sadie rallying around the most promising startups that really can make a huge impact on our local economy. Um, and even if we just help one entrepreneur, we get uh, a sense of satisfaction by helping people. And so that's really what the Growth Factory is all about. And we are gonna have our big event, it's called GFX. It's on August 25th 
in Roseville at the grounds. There's going to be hundreds of people there. We're going to be bringing on venture capitalists besides me uh, and uh, entrepreneurs, all shapes and sizes. And we're going to be talking about how we can all work together to help one another. Again, it's uh, August 25th. It is called GFX. If you want more info, hit me up on social media at the Mark Haney. Um, and then to all you out there, they're fighting the good fight for, uh, for our uh, entrepreneurship and all you fighting the good fight out there for our freedom, our security in our way of life and the 13 stripes and the 50 stars into that one American dream that's always worth fighting for. Yours. Never above you, never below you, always by your side. Thanks for watching today's show. My goal for every episode is that you find a takeaway, something tangible you can use in your business today. And if you have a comment about a favorite takeaway, feel free to put it in the, in the box below. And if you have a, a topic that you'd like me to bring up on the show, don't forget to let me know. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to learn more about entrepreneurship. Because at Haney Biz, we are always by your side.